uh, for people accused of crime. And uh, that book has never gone out of print since 1960, and uh, still is read by virtually every law student <laughs> because it's such a wonderful, accessible introduction to the Supreme Court and how the court actually operates. That was the breakthrough book. And then he wrote Make No Law, which I hope you all read last week about the uh, New York Times versus Sullivan, uh, which is a great history of free speech in this country. <clears throat> and then uh, Freedom for the uh, Thought That We Load, or the Speech That We Hate. I forget what the name of the book is, but um, it was an update of Make No Law. And he was, um, you know, he was a great... Uh, liberal columnist for the New York Times and covered the Supreme Court for a long time. He was sort of the interpreter of the court for the American public, um, making the arcane processes of the court accessible to the public. He was also uh, a mentor of mine. He helped me a lot with a Supreme Court case. He, uh, I was back at Harvard then where he was teaching. He taught at Harvard Law School. He taught at the Columbia School of Journalism in his spare time. Um, and uh, he coached me on the Supreme Court argument. We did a moot court, a pretend argument that we videotaped in which he played a Supreme Court justice. And we stayed in touch over the years. and. Um, sort of played off each other in some way. We didn't always agree. Uh, we had some disagreements over the years, but they were always friendly. I mean, he's a perfect, was a perfect uh, gentleman. He, um, he came to my class a few years ago after he published his second book and patiently answered questions for everybody. Uh, and uh, I really do miss him. He was a great uh, American, died at the age of 85, had a good, rich life. His wife, uh, Margaret Marshall, was the chief justice of the uh, Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts who wrote the first same-sex marriage case. She was the one out in front on that issue. All right, now we've got to get back to business about uh, freedom of speech and the press. And we start um, this part of the course with a wonderful decision in Hustler Magazine versus Falwell, featuring two of the, uh, of the great characters of the literature uh, about the First Amendment, Larry Flint, the world's leading, or at least the country's leading pornographer, uh, and the Reverend Jerry Falwell, who was the leader of the moral majority um, that started the movement of the religious right in this country. Uh, and what Flint did was publish a fake Campari ad uh, at the time, Campari, the Italian alcohol company, uh, was running a series of ads featuring fake interviews with celebrities about their first time. And uh, the tenor of the ad was always, well, this is their first time with a sexual experience. But it turned out that it was their first time trying Campari. Uh, and Hustler came out with um, a, a parody of the Campari ads featuring Jerry Falwell talking about his first time. His first time was in an outhouse outside Lynchburg, Virginia, where he was from. And it turned out in the so-called interview with Falwell, uh, that he had sex with his mom in this outhouse. Uh, and he, the fake interview quotes uh, Falwell as saying, Mom looked better than a Baptist whore with a $100 donation. Uh, and after they beat off the flies and the stench and so on, uh, they had a wonderful sexual adventure together. Uh, and of course, he was drunk, the interview said. Then, yeah, I always get sloshed before I go out to the pulpit. You don't think I could lay down all that bullshit sober, do you? It's a vicious, dirty joke. Um, and the whole case is sort of a morality play between the forces of good and the forces of evil. Um, and it was mean-spirited, and it was ugly, and it was sort of cruel to fall well for, for uh, Flint to do this to him. Uh, you notice way down at the bottom of the ad, in minuscule print, it says, ad parody, not to be taken seriously. Well, does that help? Um, it certainly didn't with Falwell. Um, he was highly upset by the parody and um, sued Flint and Hustler magazine. Um, for libel and for um, intentional infliction of emotional distress. And uh, the libel claim, you're well acquainted with what people have to prove uh, to win a libel case. Um, and the uh, intentional infliction of emotional distress um, has three elements. It was a common law claim that grew up in the 20th century. And in order to prove it, uh, Falwell had to prove that there was intentional conduct, intentional, not careless or anything like that. Um, that uh, offends, most of the courts say that it had to offend generally accepted standards of decency or morality. And the shorthand that the court used for that was that the conduct was outrageous. And finally, the intentional outrageous conduct had to, in fact, cause severe emotional distress. The, in the in injury here is emotional, psychological, not physical, not necessarily physical. And that's what uh, Falwell claimed against uh, Flint and Hustler magazine. And the uh, case went through the discovery process, all the pretrial stuff, and went to trial in federal district court in Virginia, in Falwell's backyard, basically. Uh, and uh, what we're about to see is what happened at the trial and then what happened when the case went to the Supreme Court. And fortunately, a movie was made about this case, among other things. Uh, the movie was The People versus Larry Flint, about 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, and it features Woody Harrelson playing Larry Flint. Uh, I forget the name of the character actor who plays uh, Falwell, but uh, Flint's lawyer in the case is Edward Norton, and Flint's girlfriend... Uh, wife is Courtney Love. Uh, and the scene starts with um, Courtney Love imploring Norton, the lawyer, to please help Flint. Flint's in jail for something completely unrelated, for a contempt of court. And at this point in his life, Flint is really strung out on drugs uh, and not thinking real carefully. 
if the technology works, we'll, we'll get right into the interview with Flint and, and the truck now. Uh, the um, movie did not include the uh, opening argument, the op any of the argument made for uh, Falwell. Um, and the lawyer for Falwell opened his argument by saying that uh, deliberate, malicious character assassination is not protected by the First Amendment, even if no one believes the statements are true. Um, well, uh, the court was, uh, the court uh, heard the argument, uh, went back and deliberated, and the opinion turns out to be written by Chief Justice Rehnquist, uh, which didn't look good for Hustler's case. Uh, notice that uh, Rehnquist wrote, uh, wore uh, stripes on, on his robe. That was an innovation that he had added to his robes. Uh, he, is, um, he was uh, a Gilbert and Sullivan fan, uh, and apparently he thought that dressing up his robe in this way made it look like the High Chancellor in the Gilbert and Sullivan plays. Uh, but uh, Rehnquist rode, rose to the occasion in the Hustler case and wrote what I think is probably the only decent opinion about the First Amendment that he wrote during his entire tenure on the court. Uh, he started out, um, it was a unanimous decision, uh, started out saying what the question was that the court had to decide, whether a public figure can recover damages for emotional harm caused by publication of an ad parody that is offensive to him and doubtless gross and repugnant in the eyes of most. Um, and the answer to that was, no, the public official can't uh, recover. Uh, and Rehnquist, uh, after stating the facts and uh, where we were, um, went off into this First Amendment rhapsody uh, going back to the marketplace of ideas concept introduced by Justice Holmes in the Abrams case. Uh, he, Rehnquist went on to discuss the New York Times versus Sullivan rule and uh, the Justice Brennan's statements in Sullivan about the rough and tumble of public debate, uh, the robust national discourse that we have under our First Amendment and so on. But then he had to address Falwell's argument that this kind of really gross, dirty, offensive, dirty joke is different from the kind of political speech that the First Amendment was designed to um, protect. In particular, because this speech, Falwell, uh, Flint's speech, was meant intentionally, with bad motives, to injure Falwell. Rehnquist responds, but in the world of public affairs, many things done with motives that are less than admirable are protected by the First Amendment. And he points out that public debate on the issues and people of the day couldn't be uninhibited if the speaker had to run the risk uh, that it might later be proved that the speaker spoke out of ill will or hatred or some other unworthy motive. And Rehnquist concludes that while a bad motive may be deemed controlling in other areas of the law, we think the First Amendment prohibits liability in the area of public debate about public figures. Otherwise, he says, that the tradition, the American tradition of political cartooning would be endangered. And this is one of those instances in which filed for the court, for the case, made a real difference. The American Association of Political Cartoonists got together, uh, and they produced and filed a brief in the Supreme Court in the Hustler case. It had very little text in it, but it had an appendix of um, maybe three dozen uh, of the great political cartoons in American history, reaching back to the one portraying George Washington as an ass uh, and taking it through the uh, Thomas Nast caricatures of the Boss Tweed Gang in, in New York in the 19th century and bring it up into the Reagan administration. And in all of these cartoons, political leaders, public figures, public officials were, portra were caricatured viciously. Uh, their unpleasant physical characteristics were exaggerated. Uh, whatever they had done was exaggerated. Uh, and a lot of them were really very mean-spirited. Uh, but Rehnquist's sort of a history buff uh, said that our political discourse would be considerably poorer without that tradition of political cartooning. Well, then Falwell argues, yeah, but this is not like those pol political cartoons. This one is so over the top, outrageous. The jury, after all, found that it was outrageous, uh, that that distinguishes it from the usual kind of maybe mean um, political cartoon. What's wrong with that? Doesn't that do the job? Can't you draw a distinction based on how outrageous the cartoon is, Nicole? Yeah. Well, who would measure outrageousness? Are you yeah. Getting that taste with that? Oh, not like it. I mean, what? Getting that taste of everything in the movie. Taste? Yeah. With what you're saying. It's outrageous. Like, my taste of what outrageous would be would be different from what he did. Yeah. You know? So, what's wrong with that? It's hard to have an equal line of judgment for all of these. Yeah, I'd leave the jury at sea to act on their own sense of, am I outraged? Uh, offends my taste. Uh, and leaves a jury free to uh, hammer somebody with liability because they don't like what that person said or they don't like that person. And the concept of, of outrageousness is not the kind of scalpel, precise tool needed to separate protected speech from unprotected speech. And that's what Rehnquist said, that um, while this kind of cartoon is at best a distant cousin of the political cartoons in history, and it's rather a poor relation at that, it's not possible to lay down a principled standard to distinguish them. Outrageousness is not a principled standard. It is inherently subjective and would allow the jury to award damages based on its taste or dislike of the publisher. Uh, and Rehnquist points out that the court had never allowed liability because speech might have an adverse emotional impact on the audience. That goes back to the Jehovah's Witnesses cases. Um, the fact that society may find speech offensive is not a sufficient reason for suppressing it. Government has to remain neutral 
in the marketplace of ideas. And so the court held that the judgment against, against uh, Hustler magazine was invalid, that the First Amendment protected Hustler's speech in this instance. Uh, and it's a little bit reminiscent of the Justice Brennan's decision in the Sullivan case, where Brennan says, we have to have a robust public dialogue. Mistakes are inevitable in, in public debate. Uh, you can't have a test of truth. Uh, the fact that it defames somebody who's a public official doesn't mean it's unprotected. And you just wait for the last, the other shoot to drop and, and Brennan to say, therefore, no libel suits by public officials about their conduct in office. And instead, he did a detour into the actual malice rule, the constitutional fault rule. Well, in, in the Hustler case, Rehnquist marshals all of this First Amendment uh, history, background, reasoning, rhetoric, and you wait for him to say, and therefore, public figures may not recover for a publication that allegedly causes, even intentionally, emotional distress. And he'd stop short of that and does the same detour into actual malice. Because the rule that he announces in uh, the Hustler case is that a public figure and public official may not recover damages for intentional infliction of emotional distress without proving a false statement of fact made with actual malice, with constitutional fault. And the jury, in this case, had decided that there was no, fact, no false factual statement. Nobody could have believed that it was factual. And therefore, um, Falwell loses. Um, the case is, has become an exceptionally strong protection of the press in particular, uh, but of free speech in general. Uh, against suits for damages um, other than libel suits, where people who think they're injured because of something that is published uh, want to sue for damages. Uh, the hustler rule is basically if what you're claiming is damages from something that is published, you can't do an end run around the Sullivan rule by saying that, oh, well, this suit is not for libel, this is for intentional infliction of emotional distress, or some other tort that a fertile-minded lawyer might think up uh, to allege. If the gist of what you're complaining about is injury from a publication, if you're a public figure or a public official, you must prove constitutional fault. Um, and the... Um, Falwell satire of a public figure, uh, basically offensive and mean-spirited, ends up being protected. Uh, let's look at some others uh, subsequent to that. The Danish cartoons that we've mentioned before, uh, published by a small newspaper in Denmark, um, caricatured the Prophet Mohammed. They're not even supposed to do images of him, but they, the most uh, inflammatory one um, was the one portraying the Prophet uh, with a bomb in his turban, uh, which uh, led to a worldwide boycott, or a Arab world, Muslim world, boycott of Danish products, uh, riots in various places. The Danish embassy was bombed in a couple of places, uh, and the cartoons were viewed as demeaning Islam. Uh, and then, sort of in response to the Danish cartoons, uh, whether the president of uh, Iran, I can never say his name, right, decided to hold a Holocaust uh, cartoon contest, and the winner uh, was this one, showing uh, Israel erecting a wall around the mosque, on the wall showing a picture of Auschwitz, the uh, concentration, the Nazi concentration camp. Uh, and then during the 2008 presidential election, the New Yorker um, magazine ran this cartoon featuring, featuring a caricature of Michelle Obama dressed up in a, a Black Panther outfit uh, with an AK-47, uh, Barack in an Arab-looking costume, uh, the American flag going up in flames in the uh, Oval Office fireplace, and what looks like a portrait of Osama bin Laden uh, in the Oval Office. Uh, it was sort of a failed satire. Uh, it was intended, apparently, to satirize the lunatic fringe right people who were claiming that Michelle Obama is a Black Panther and that uh, Barack was, uh, was too sympathetic to uh, militant Islam and so on. But that was, that, the richness of that humor was lost on um, <clears throat> most of the public. And then uh, the LA Daily News satirized the New Yorker cartoon uh, showing uh, George Bush dressed up in the militant outfit with the AK-47 uh, and Dick Cheney uh, dressed up as a Muslim with a portrait of Richard Nixon over the Oval, Oval Office fireplace and the Constitution burning in the fireplace. Uh, and then Vanity Fair uh, commissioned a, a cartoon, which was a parody of maybe some of the others, and with uh, Cindy and John McCain in the Oval Office, uh, Cindy with a handful of pills. You may remember she was accused of being addicted to various kinds of painkillers and stuff. And McCain on a walker, uh, because his age was viewed as an infirmity during the campaign, uh, with a picture of uh, George Bush over the fireplace with, once again, the Constitution burning up in the fireplace. All of these um, are characters. All of them are somewhat mean-spirited. All of them might be considered outrageous. All of them probably upset their targets to some degree. All of them might hurt feelings, and all of them are protected by the First Amendment under the Falwell case. Um, questions about that case? Case? There was one undecided judge. I don't recall it. The decision was unanimous. There was no dissent. Nine. Well.